Hi Spring fans! In this week's installment of Spring Tips, we're going to look at how to demystify some of the perceived magic in the typical Spring Boot application. When I do talks, people wonder about some of these applications I build, especially in, in Spring Cloud World, where a single annotation switches on a whole, uh, a whole barrage of functionality that, um, whose implementation may not be directly connected to the annotation. So what I want to do is I want to explore uh, just a little bit uh, how Spring Boot in particular uh, configures things for us and, and what you can do to sort of pull back the veil and understand what's happening in the background when you see some of these things happening. Because at the end of the day, Spring is just a, a configuration, uh, an application context in a configuration container. It's just a big bag of beans and uh, everything that Spring does is just about managing these, these beans and these objects. So let's go ahead and build a, a typical example in the Spring Cloud world, the config server. right? So I'm going to build a config service. I'll build a config server. I've got the web support there. I don't need it really. Um, and let's just hit generate. Now, this config service, let me try it again. Here we go. This config service is a Spring Boot application, and it's going to babysit a directory full of configuration. So the example I always use for my, for my example here is this uh, Git repository. And I'll clone that to my directory here, my desktop, config, and in my, uh, in my Spring Boot application, I'll say spring.application.name equals config hyphen service. And um, I'll tell it where to uh, find the configuration, which is the directory we've just cloned, so Spring Cloud Config Server dot git uh, git dot uri equals home desktop config, and uh, finally I'll tell it to run on port eighty eight eighty eight. All right. Now, in order for all that to have effect, I need to say at enable config server, and then I can run it. I just hit Command R or Control R, rather. And uh, it spins up a it spins up the instance inside of my IDE, and within a few seconds here, I'll have a config server, and I can confirm as much by going to a localhost uh, eighty eight eighty eight reservation hyphen service forward slash default. So you can see I've built a REST API. It's acts it's babysitting you know mediating access to to these configuration files, and it's doing all this based on what this annotation and a pointer to the directory where it should find the configuration. And uh, so I can, you know, I, I understand the complaints that it's a little indirect. It's not easy to sort of understand what just happened. So let's go ahead and take a moment to kind of uh, take a look at, first of all, Spring Boot's auto configuration mechanism. When Spring Boot starts up, it looks on the class path for a text file called spring.factories. It finds this text file in various jars. In particular, for Spring Boot, it'll find a text file in Spring Boot auto configured directory, or jar rather, in the meta inf folder inside that jar. So when it finds that jar, it'll then find this. Uh, this is a service loader. Spring Factories is. So it it's a, a a name, an attribute mapped to Java configuration classes, and different parts of Spring use different you know keys to determine which classes to load. Uh, Spring Boot, in particular, cares about the one that says Org Spring Framework Boot Auto Configure Enable Auto Configuration. When Spring Boot starts up, it tries to run every single one of these Java configuration classes, all of them that you see there. And you can see there's quite a lot, right? There's Auto Configuration here for Couchbase and Cassandra and Elasticsearch and MongoDB and Neo4j and WebSockets and Hypermedia and JMS and JTA and JNDI and database migrations and JaxRS and security and, I mean, just everything, right? All these different things which may at first be a little off-putting. We don't want all of these to be running if we don't have the libraries on the class path uh, to support them, for example. But Spring will try to run them all. So to, to kind of understand what's happening, let's take a look at uh, just a particular random auto, you know, auto configuration. In this case, the Rabbit MQ auto configuration. This is just a Spring Java configuration class. So if you know about Spring's Java configuration, you know that configuration classes uh, are just Java configuration classes that can produce objects. Uh, and uh, the, the objects are produced from bean provider methods, be methods that are annotated with at bean. This configuration class has a few extra annotations that you may not recognize. These are the conditional annotations here. The uh, conditional annotations were introduced 
in Spring 4, and uh, they're, they are what power Spring Boot, right? They're, they're one of the things that make Spring Boot possible. It allows Spring to conditionally activate uh, different objects based on certain tests. We've done this before. We've had similar support for this, uh, you know, sort of support for this with, uh, with profiles. So in the past, you could use Spring Profiles to conditionally activate uh, certain, certain parts of the object graph. But it was limited to the presence or lack of presence of that profile. In Spring 4, we've made generic that, that conditional mechanism. So now you can provide any arbitrary connect, uh, condition to conditionally activate a beam. So here we have a condition, that, a condition that says, create this configuration class, but only so long as the type called RabbitTemplate.class is on the class path. And similarly, create this configuration class only so long as the channel.class is on the class path. You can see that in my IDE right now, this is red. So these types are not on the class path. Thus, when Spring Boot starts up, all of this will be inert. It won't, it won't get activated at all. None of it will be evaluated. So this configuration is as good as not present, basically. If it were to be present, if we were to go to our, our, our Maven build here, we could add, for example, Spring Boot Starter AMQP. And when the class path adjusts, suddenly the types become available. Now, these classes are going to be activated. And uh, then Spring will try and evaluate each individual bean. Well, in this case, it's going to create a connection factory to talk to RabbitMQ. This is the uh, client side middleware that we can use to talk to a RabbitMQ instance. It's going to try and, try and create that bean for us, but it's only going to do so if there is not already a bean of type connection factory in the context somewhere, right? So this is a Spring Framework AMQP rabbit, rabbit .connection .connection factory. If you have defined a bean somewhere else in your own Java configuration, for example, here, you know, we'll, I'll uh, leave actually implementing that for you, uh, for you as an exercise for you, but suppose we had defined our own bean, my custom rabbit MQ connection factory. Suppose we had defined our own bean. This bean would take precedence. Spring would ignore this bean here in this, in this configuration class uh, in general. So we'd be able to override the object itself. We'd be able to change the bit of functionality uh, that gets used to connect to a connect to RabbitMQ. So, you know, we've added, we've told Spring we want RabbitMQ. We've signaled that by adding uh, the Spring Boot Starter AMQP support here on the class path. Spring Boot Starter AMQP, you know, mostly uh, just brings in other libraries. These starter dependencies in Spring Boot very rarely have any Java code in them, almost never. Uh, in fact, their primary function is to simply manage other libraries to bring them in for you. So here we bring in the basic Spring Boot starter, the RabbitMQ types, and the Spring messaging. The auto configuration code, this class in particular, uh, lives in one jar, Spring Boot auto configure. So there's, you know, dozens and dozens of different auto configurations in the one Spring Boot main jar, uh, and different combinations of libraries activate different. Uh, uh, auto configurations in that one main Spring Boot jar. So here we've used the Spring Boot starter AMQP to light up or to toggle on or activate the functionality in the RabbitMQ auto configuration. That's not to say that you couldn't, you know, explicitly bring in Spring Boot starter AMQP directly, uh, or rather the dependencies in Spring Boot starter AMQP directly. So you could bring these three libraries into your code uh, directly instead of using Spring Boot starter AMQP, and you'd have exactly the same effect, right? You'd have exactly the same effect as if you had used Spring Boot Starters AMQP. So uh, beware of that. If you're not using starters, but some things are, are, are available and some things become active, it might be because you've got a library that um, activates a certain bit of functionality. Which brings us to the next question. We know that Spring Boot has these conditions and that these conditions can be used to conditionally activate um, uh, different uh, parts of the object graph. We know that these conditions are specializations of the, at, of the at conditional annotation in Spring 4 and that the at conditional annotation uh, in turn takes a condition object, a condition class literal reference that in turn just provides some programmatic test. It tests for anything. It tests that there's another object on the, uh, in the application context. It tests for the presence of a certain property. It tests for, for anything, right? It tests, you know, is, is Mercury in retrograde? It doesn't matter. It, it can you can, you can programmatically describe it, then you can test it. And so that is part of the story. How do you know which tests are true or false? Which ones are active at any given uh, 
point. And for this, we have the uh, the dash dash debug option. So if you pass, if you specify debug in your application of properties, like this equals true, or you specify it as a dash dash you know debug equals true, or even just debug equals true, or if you specify it in your IDE, for example here in IntelliJ, you can say at enable debug output. There's a checkbox there. Whatever you do, the result will get you to a very useful uh, utility here. Let me comment out these three bits because I don't need them. The result will get you to a very useful utility. That is to say, it'll print out a, uh, an enumeration of all the different auto configurations and the conditions that have evaluated uh, positive or negatively, uh, as well as the um, uh, sort of unactive ones, right? So let's go ahead and see the outcomes uh, of, of all the different conditions in the application. So this is going to tell you all the things that Spring Boot, when it tried to start up, uh, evaluated in order to arrive at uh, the state that it's in when, it, when it's running. So let's see. There we are. So there are our conditions. And if you see, uh, the conditions here are printed out in a convenient, easy to uh, sort of read uh, uh, format on the console. Scrolling up here, we can see the negative matches. These are the tests that were attempted but did not match. And you can see a breakdown of the class and then the specific condition, you know, in the annotation uh, conditional. Uh, and the test that it was trying to run. And then we can see up here the positive tests, the ones that did match. And I think this is, this is uh, usually far more interesting. So here we go, the auto configuration port. This says that um, we, uh, we evaluated the we evaluated whether a bean of type abstract audit listener uh, was uh, not available inside of the uh, Auto configuration called audit auto configuration, and thus the you know the uh, bean provider or the configuration class on which that active annotation was present was activated. So this is the you know now we have an easy way to understand which beans are in play based on the auto configuration uh, and which ones are uh, you know contributed through auto configuration. That still doesn't entirely explain this. This is an at enable annotation and in Spring. Uh, since Spring 3.1, we've had at enable annotations that are sort of the Java annotation configuration equivalent of the uh, the various annotation hyphen driven uh, elements in the XML, in the old style XML. So, for example, if you had transaction, if you wanted to enable transaction management in Spring, you could say tx colon annotation hyphen driven in the XML, and now there's at enable transaction management, for example. Well, what's happening here is that when Spring sees this annotation, and it sees that it has at import, It'll import the configuration class, which it needs to, to uh, you know, to run. And a lot of times, these imports just bring in a relevant object, and the relevant object, because it's now present in the application context, then allows a auto configuration condition to evaluate to true. So the rest of it gets triggered based on the auto configuration. Sometimes the the import just the at enable just asserts that you are interested in opting into whatever functionality you're trying to get to and uh, you bring in a marker object or some sort of object that uh, Spring cares about and um, if it's there then it's used to to tell the config server to, or you know to tell the auto configuration somewhere else that it should activate uh, the rest of the graph that's required to support that functionality and this is a very common pattern so uh, for example if you use Spring Boot Starter uh, batch on the uh, on the class path that that batch support still requires at, at enable batch processing for example Right. Uh, this is just to stipulate that you want uh, certain functionality in place. So we've looked now at Java configuration. We've looked at auto configuration. We looked at uh, how you can override certain parts of the object graph at all times by providing objects of well-known types. Because remember, at the end of the day, Spring is just a framework, and uh, Spring, uh, Spring, um, you know, you, is open for extension but closed for modification. You can provide objects that are intended to. Uh, be slotted into the in as a cog of the machine, so to speak, and uh, and Spring will do the right thing on it with it based on its type. Uh, earlier, we looked at how Rabbit 
the Rabbit Auto Configuration, made it dead simple to override auto the uh, configuration for a connection factory uh, by providing a replacement beam. But that's a little, a little overkill, isn't it? That's like throwing the baby out with the bathwater. That's a, a whole lot of functionality here that I wouldn't have to, wouldn't want to have to duplicate just to tweak one little thing. And so, thankfully, uh, we can, we have a much easier annual, uh, avenue. Uh, uh, to pursue a much easier channel by which we can customize the creation of this connection factory and that is to say we can provide properties you see Spring Boot has another kind of component called a configuration properties poja so here's a configuration properties object it's an annotation that signals to Spring that all properties that come from the environment be they from the application of properties in the jar or from the ad uh, adjacent environment or from environment variables or from the, config, from the config server from JNDI or whatever this this property, these properties get mapped onto fields on this POJO. So spring dot dot host, spring dot dot port, spring dot dot username dot password dot SSL dot virtual host, etc. 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 So I can override the default here. These these values get overlaid onto these fields, and then the configuration can inject that configuration properties object, and then use that to uh, sort of configure the connection factory. In this case, if I wanted to uh, point my RabbitMQ connection factory to a particular host, I could use the configuration object to, uh, you know, to resolve the host that the, the user has specified. And this way, I don't have to override the whole connection factory bean. I can just, I can just tailor that one part of the, uh, of the configuration. So with, with properties and with the, uh, the smart application of auto configuration and the conditional annotations, we're able to change everything in the, in the stack, everything in the, in the framework, everything in, in the, uh, in the machine, you have full control. So with that, I want to uh, we'll wrap up by saying that Spring Boot's most powerful asset is its uh, convenience and how easy it makes it to uh, to build simple applications. Uh, thanks for joining, and I see you next time.